Hello there and welcome to this vlog of May 2022. Today's topic is actually going to be a continuation of uh, a series of topics that I ran earlier this year, which I believe I titled Weird, uh, Wonderful and Terrifying Organisations in the Battletech Galaxy, something like that. And this will actually be part four. I noted that these got barely any views, but I got a lot of like personal messages about them strangely enough like at least like 10 people emailed me and said like oh I really liked that topic can you do more of those so here we are um I'm not in this for the views I'm here because I like researching things about Battletech and then talking about them so uh, if people ask for stuff like that I'll certainly do it um I think just over the last like few months I've been so kind of concentrated on like the Battletech project like on tabletop and stuff like you know my house rules and I'm really getting back into Battletech and exploring lots of new things so it's this has kind of taken a little bit of a back seat but that's not on purpose this will always be like one of the mainstays of the channel you know talking about the law within Battletech but I suppose it depends on what's happening in the real world with Battletech because when they announce a Kickstarter that obviously gets me very like geared up and excited for what that Kickstarter will be but I think we've got a little bit of a lull now before the Kickstarter gets formally announced so I could probably do quite a bit more lore over the next couple of months so that will be very nice because I do love the Battletech lore. Anyway on to today's topic so we're going to be talking about um, something very interesting today which is the Brotherhood of uh, Cincinnatus. Um, this is um, a Lyran-like organisation, a legitimate organisation as well. There's no kind of um, ambiguity. There's no like, oh, do they exist? Don't they exist? They are a, for want of a better term, a secret society that everybody knows about and you can kind of become a paid-up member. I suppose much like the Masons, something like that. Um, and much like the Masons have lodges, the Brotherhood of Cincinnati have, like, cells. Um but what I'll do in order to discuss these, I'll kind of, I'll bring it back to like, we'll talk about their name because that's important. We'll talk about when they were formulated because that's important. And then where they kind of exist in like in geopolitical sense and when they're really important is between like, say, like the 3005 and like 3030 in and around that. That's where they become like really quite a, an important mover and shaker within the Battletech galaxy. So, as I said, they are a Lyran institution. Um, they were created in 2889, uh, kind of in the in the Third Succession Wars. So what I'll do is I'll talk a little bit about that and then we'll move on to their name because I think that's important as well. That is a bit of a giveaway. But the Third Succession Wars was like a real meat grinder of an affair. It's like at that time in, in the Battletech like chronology... There were no more warships. Warfare was like very much like localised, but it was absolutely brutal and a real meat grinder. And the Lyrans at that time find themselves in a real war of attrition for literally decades against both the Draconis Combine um, and the Free Worlds League, kind of against the Capellans as well, like they're traditional enemies, but they share the actual border with the uh, Draconis Combine and the Free Worlds League. So that was a, a real like, you know, tension between those states. And... All the societies in this phase, well, not just the Lyrans that suffered with this, they all become very militaristic because of this, as you would expect, because they're kind of so big and so powerful. Like, yes, they, they you know, through the succession wars, they regress a lot in, like, a technological standpoint, but they've still got, like, vast industrial powers. They can still make those, like, succession war era mechs that are just competent, but not great. So things like, you know, the Centurion, the Trebuchet, the Panther... Uh, and they can throw just like an untold amount of like combined arms and infantry into battles. So it does become like a horrific meat grinder. And out of this are born, like in Lyran um, traditions, they, that's where the Brotherhood of Cincinnati are, are really created. And it's almost, it's like a veterans group that really kind of, um, you know, espouses the, like the purity of the Lyran state and how Steiner and how their way is the way to do things. And that if they just have that one final push, They'll go and defeat the other inner sphere powers and they will get the, you know, the first, uh, they'll become, or the House Steiner will become the first lords of the Star League and then they can unite the inner sphere. There'll be some kind of like orchestrated conspiratorial thing which 
we don't really know what that is. Um, I've got a lot of documentation about this group. There's not much online, but I've actually got the hard copy books which tell you about them. Uh, but there's no like definitive answer. It's, no one just says, ah, this is what they are, this is what they do. It's, it is ambiguous, but they are, you can definitely sense that there are like, you know, underhanded sinister things going on with this with this operation. But unlike the lower levels of the cells, they are very much just a, a veterans group. And that is kind of as, as mundane as it sounds. It's basically like a beer and pretzels organisation for like the German soldiers. Um, obviously, Lyran um, culture is very, very like um, regimented. It really lacks meritocracy. So you, I, 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 I think I may have read this, but it's, um, I, I've forgotten it while I'm talking about it. But I, I'm not sure if like a regular soldier can join this organisation. You probably did have to be like an officer. I'm not sure about that. Um, not that that really matters because, you know, veterans groups, you know, you can get veterans groups of which there are, you know, even in our own world, there are hundreds of thousands of them. Um, in the inner sphere, there will be probably millions of them given how big the militaries are. So you've got, you might have like a, you know, a, a veterans group that is just for a specific regiment. Whereas this, like, um, this veterans group is all about like the there's kind of a wider geopolitical thing here, and where that becomes very very like prevalent during the third succession wars, which again is a meat grinder that really kind of looks like it's got no end to it. Is that the the Brotherhood of Cincinnati has become very powerful within the Estates General, which is kind of the lower house parliament, for want of a better term, of uh, the Lyran Commonwealth. They really push this idea of putting like a a powerful like alpha male. I say alpha male specifically, that's clearly what they're after. They're after like a, a general who kind of, you know, has all the, you know, that Germanic, um, like militarism behind them and they're going to go and crush the Draconis Combine and, you know, all that stuff. Uh, much like in our own world, like much, I suppose, like you'd say, like the Russians have turned to Putin, you know, or like the Germans turned to Hitler, um, you know, back in, in World War Two. It's like when a, a state is facing crisis it will turn to what like the the strong man um which is always quite sad and quite tragic because usually these people are like well always they're deeply insecure and very problematic and their poison kind of in infects uh, their entire civilization and that's really what they were pushing within their own um you know society and out of that, you got um, a chap called uh, Alexandro Steiner, who is quite a nefarious leader. Um, pretty terrible, very like warmongering. But he was seen as like the, the person who would deliver him from, from the third, third Succession Wars. And, you know, there are, there are like events, um, like war events, basically, battles, things like that that occur... Uh, at this time where you've got like um, huge forces like facing off against each other and it'll just it's so like almost like a reflection of World War One, where you've got like soldiers dying en masse to gain a planet that they then lose like a couple of months later and then it repeats itself whereas in World War One, it was just like done on trench lines at, you know across like Belgium and France uh, in this war or in, on Lyons it will have been like world by world so and even like Alexandro can't break this, although he does have some like initial successes, and that's what really the Brotherhood get behind. They also really get into like the marketing and the like recruitment drive. So you know, like the if you've seen like the film Star um, Starship Troopers, that like um, you know join up today, or if you go back into like World War One and look at like Kitchener campaigns, that you know that your country needs you kind of thing. That's kind of what the Brotherhood were doing, and it was all kind of backed up around uh, Alexandro being that like strongman leader that was going to end the succession wars and deliver them from that like endless, um, you know, the meat grinder, the endless, terrifying, terrible succession wars. So, you know, there the were, they did have good intentions to some level, but I'd say that, you know, those intentions were very badly misplaced and very problematic and weren't ever going to resolve anything which they didn't now why they become very like important um and i think this this ties down to their name as well which we need to talk about before we talk about the geopolitics and that's cincinnatus um if you know your history 
Uh, Cincinnatus was actually a Roman dictator in the 4th century. And he's quite famous if you're into history. If you're not into history, you've probably never heard of this guy. Um, but he was like a farmer and took up the mantle to become dictator, led the Romans to, to victory at that time. You know, this is kind of the like mid latter end of the, the Roman experience. So they were facing lots of problems on the outskirts, led the Romans to victory. But then this is why he's famous. He then gave up the, the power and basically went back to being a farmer. And I think that's really how the 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 Brotherhood of uh, Cincinnati see themselves. That like you know the, that concept of like virtuous leadership, where you take on like um, something for the good of society, and then you give power back. This is something that like we romanticize in the West, and in the nineteenth century, it was very very popular for political leaders to do this. You know, kind of say, "I don't want political power. I wouldn't take it if I was given it." Whereas deep down, they are very ambitious, and they would take the power. But it's kind of like the zeitgeist at that time to be seen as power corrupts you know that kind of thing whereas in the society that we're in now politicians are very happy to say yeah i'm, I'm happy to have power <laughs> so depends what way you kind of existing whereas so the the brotherhood of cincinnati obviously had that like virtue over um you know over power structures but deep down they are really kind of pushing their power their ethos on society it's very hypocritical but again i wouldn't expect any different from either a secret society or, or a society that really wants to push that like that strongman edict which is always bound to fail um you know history never has has someone like that who sucks they might succeed in the short run but then they always the, the poison always seeps out and they always become horrendous um but something very interesting happens then, and this is what causes the the brotherhood of, of cincinnati to become a real uh, interesting player and again, keep in mind that they do have that like virtue um, thing going on, you know, that like really ingrained moralism and the purity of, of, of the Lyran cause. And their man, Alexander, uh, sorry, Alexandro, he is, now there's a debate, he's either ousted or he kind of gives up of his own volition. It's kind of debated what happens to him. Um, the Brotherhood of Cincinnati would absolutely say he was like ousted. Uh, others would say that he gave up uh, political power who knows and it all came about because of an, an entity with the, the lyran commonwealth called the estates general now the estates general in like a historical context you probably know if you know your history he's, he's very much associated to france uh during the french revolution the estates general were the it was it's the it was like the nobility the clergy and then kind of like the artisan classes who uh, all came together if there was a problem to discuss how to do things. Now, the king always kind of existed above that, but the, the Estates General was there almost as like an outlet for the what they considered like the very regimented three sections of society to come together and discuss things. That really didn't go as planned during the, or the in the build-up to the French Revolution, though, because it was the Estates General where the, like the, you know, the third estate or the, the artisan classes, the professional classes came together and that's where they really created what became the, like the, the brainchild of the French Revolution and the modern world. And the Estates General in the Lyran Commonwealth is similar to a lot of respects. It's almost like a lower parliament. And it, this is something I have like, you know, everyday experience of because I live in a state which is a constitutional monarchy and similar to the Lyrans in a lot of respects, although one major difference, our monarch has no actual power. She is theoretically the the top of the tree, right? Like she is, she's the only person, oh, in fact, no, I think there are, is it the estates? I can't remember, I can't remember the exact title, but there is someone within the system who also exists um, between all three, um, like entities of state, which is the legislative, the executive, and the judiciary. Is it the attorney general? I want to say I can't remember off the top of my head. But the queen sits there as well. So the queen in Britain, the queen is head of parliament. She's head of the government. She's uh, head of the judiciary, and she's also head of the armed forces. So technically, she is the queen and has control of everything. But in reality, the power sits with the House of Parliament, the lower parliament. Uh, they are the executive, they're the ones passing the laws, they're, the Queen basically just signs them and sanctions them. And if the Queen decided not to do that, well, the House of Parliament could absolutely trump that by having the next, like, um, 
like white paper, green paper that they draft up saying we're actually abolishing the monarchy now. Um, so the Queen's got to be very careful, obviously. But she exists as like head of state. The Lyrans, their head of state is the Archon. And the Archon is pretty much all powerful. I mean, it kind of depends on the Archon and who they've got. Like some will be much more kind of swayed by things like the Estates General and will listen to the lower house. Um, but in terms of like actual power, like it's you know it's it's complex within all the inner sphere powers. Um, but I think you probably look at the. I think the one that we recognise most as a real modern day democracy are the Free Worlds League. Um, they've kind of almost got like a federal system. That's why a lot of people call them like Space America, um, which is not true really. But yeah, I can understand why people think that. Um, whereas like the Lyrans and the Fed Sons have pretty similar systems. They're almost like constitutional monarchies, but with a lot more power orientated towards the monarchy than say like our um, you know modern constitutional monarchy in Britain. Or in, in other nations that have monarchies as well, whether it's like Sweden or the Netherlands. Obviously in Europe, a lot of countries don't. Like France, for instance, they did away with their monarchy a long time ago. So they have just got their own, you know, they, um, the, you know, the revolution formulated their system and they still have a, a system that's similar to that. In Britain, we have something similar, but it was out of our revolution, which, you know, back in the, you know, uh, what like the 1640s and Cromwell and all that good stuff so we've we kind of went through our revolution and that formulated that the House of Parliament was the the thing and that was all then um, rat ratified in what we term the glorious revolution of 1688 which is you know King Billy and the you know the that's kind of where our system still is now with that like that the monarch is very much like centrifugal to that but he's secondary to it and he's always seen as like the you know the um, imperative to the system but not dictatorial if you want to put it that way and the Lyrans have like I say have a, have a similar system to that but at this time obviously you know the Estates General do get more power now this is I suppose from like a socio-economic political re rationale that makes a lot of sense because the third succession wars were so meat grindy and so bloody you can well understand that like they really would have needed the estates general to keep things going so they did things you know like taxes were paid to them things like that so they probably did have a lot of power just through the bureaucratic bureaucratic nature of having a, a society that was always at warfare they will have needed that like infrastructure and the kind of theory is that the estates general were kind of really kind of prevalent in ousting good old uh, alexandro and then helping very famous uh, Battletech character Katrina Steiner into power. Now Katrina is, I think, one of my favourite characters in Battletech. She's she's one of those characters. I think, like on a geopolitical level, I really don't think there's anyone more important than her. I think you probably argue that Hans Davian's like super important as well. And obviously, I'm talking about the era which I kind of play in. So that thirty twenty five to thirty sixty seven era in those in that period. You know, Katrina Steiner is an absolute, like, you know, one of the, like, centrifugal characters. And she does something really quite interesting. And it's kind of testament to her character and to how the, um, how she changed the very nature of the inner sphere. Because in the 3020s, she actually, this is kind of at the end of the succession wars and things have just got so brutal and so horrifying and society has regressed so badly. I think there's kind of a concerted effort within that generation at the time to try and fix things. You know, that happened, not all, everybody obviously, but a lot of people just want something better. I think you can kind of equate it to how our civilization was after World War Two, where we'd been through like six years of just, you know, what, between 40 and 60 million people dead. You know, infrastructure in Europe just absolutely flattened and destroyed. Um, you know, in 1945, the discovery of what happened to, you know, uh, during the Holocaust. Like, just things that we didn't know we were capable of as, of a species. And it just horrifying us. And out of that was born something where we wanted a better life for our children, basically, at that time. And, you know, if you, if you know, I mean, especially if you're my age and you kind of grew up on the tales of your grandparents, they would have openly said things like this, you know, like we, and not just them, but the generation that was 
like in power post World War Two, wanted a, a better world, and I mean it, this is no more like prevalent than than in Britain. Uh, in 1945, Churchill, who is widely regarded as like the greatest hero in British history, after you know, given that Britain had to stand alone against the Nazis for a considerable amount of time before we you know before the rest of the world got involved, and looked like a battle we were never going to win but Churchill somehow managed to guide us through it you know with his kind of um with his attitude and the charisma things like that after world war 2 the one of the first things that the british people did was they unelected him so he was no longer prime minister because he was seen as the old regime and out of that we had things born like um socialized medicine and um, like what became like the welfare state, you know, like trying not to leave people behind, things like that, which I know that's in today's day and age, that's a controversial topic in of its own right. But at the time, it was just seen as like the brave new world. We're going to create something that, you know, where people can get by no matter where you're born or what class, because we still had a very like class heavy society back then. Even now we still have a class based society but certainly was the case back in like the 1940s and 50s. So it's like no matter where you were born, you could, you know, hope to, you wouldn't be left behind. You would get an education. You would be able to get, you know, medical service, things like that. Now, I always kind of look at it like that's what happened in the Battletech universe in the 30-20s. And there's no one who's like the poster child for that more than Katrina Steiner. And Katrina Steiner, to kind of show that she meant business, she actually offered peace to all the other inner sphere powers, which is something unheard of. You know, the, the succession wars were so brutal, they hated each other so much. You know, some more than others. So, like, the Draconis combined with traditional enemies were, like, the Lyrans and the Fed Sons. But there were powers that just really didn't have much history of each other at all and did quite have and have quite similar systems. Most famously, obviously, the Lyrans and the Fed Sons. And it's no coincidence that they're the ones that ended up forming the alliance because they had similar systems, similar worldviews. I suppose you could look at it like they were kind of France and Britain, or, well, more specifically, it would have been France and Germany, with the Steiners being Germans. And uh, the Fed Sons traditionally having that, like, Anglo-French, like, feel to them as well. So you have a situation where that, you know, that olive branch of peace actually went somewhere. Uh, Hans Devian actually accepted, and out of that is born the informal alliance between the, the Lyrans and uh, the Davians. You have then at that time as well the first real, like, uh, not things happen before this, like, especially with the Wolf Dragoons. The Wolf uh, Dragoons, like, create new technology, so, but they're kind of a weird one because they're actually clans. Long story if you don't know that. I might do a video on that one day. Um, but they kind of came back, they, just in terms of their mechs, for instance, they created things like the Annihilator and the Marauder 2. Um, they came back with, like, Star League mechs, which the clans, for the clans was, like, obsolete mechs, but for the Inner Sphere, they were like, oh, my God, we haven't seen this level of technology in years. Hello. <laughs> um, but for the, in the thirty twenties, you had this, like, real push not just by the like the the informal Fedcom alliance, but also the Capellans were really keen on this as well, like developing new mechs. Uh, and I'm using mechs as the kind of height of example, but you're also talking about other social reforms that happen. You're talking about technological advances, uh, medical advances, things like that. But we'll just talk about mechs because that's what we're all here for. Uh, and the Capellans create like um, the Cataract, the Raven at that time, uh, the Fed Sons, and the and. Um, the Lyrans create things like the Hatchet Man, all through uh, Project Phoenix. So you've got this like this real push to kind of improve things, to stop the succession wars, and to do something more like socially coherent and less destructive. Now, because that really interferes with the concept of like Lyran purity, the Brotherhood of Cincinnati have a major issue with this. Um, they. I heard it in one of the books that I've got that talk about the um, the Brotherhood. They've kind of got this like weird interview in there with someone who's like in the Brotherhood, it's like a colonel or something like that, who's like, yeah, I have no problem with the Davians. In fact, I quite like the Davians. We've got no like history with them at all until we signed that damn peace agreement with them uh, and then like allied ourselves with them. That never should have happened. It was a, well, the worst mistake that the, the Commonwealth has ever made, that kind of thing. 
And in hindsight, he, he was correct because that alliance led to the Fedcom Civil War, which was utterly brutal and destructive and horrifying. But at that, this moment in time, in the 3020s, they didn't know that, obviously. So Katrina Steiner was just trying to stop, you know, the wars and to, re, you know, to try and create some kind of peaceful system. And she handed that olive branch to all the inner sphere powers. Now, you could take a cynical view and say that she was polit politicising. I don't think that's the case. I think Katrina Steiner is much more unlike the JFK side of the fence here you know like jfk in his dealings with the russians was very much like i don't want to kind of play the hardball with the russians because i know that will make them more militaristic and we'll just have more problems i think yeah you know, i think katrina really did have like um pure uh like intentions to to, have to get peace but out of this like monumental shift and the brotherhood of sin of sin the brotherhood of cincinnatus uh, I always want to say Cincinnati. Um, that would be embarrassing. So Cincinnatus. Uh, they actually, because they are a cell organisation, this becomes very important. There is a lot of speculation that they're then involved in like terrorist activities uh, because they are so upset at the, the concept of dare to have been like thrown in there with the, you know, the Davians and losing that like Steiner purity. So over like a 10 year period, they lose their man in Alexandro. And then they feel like they lose their battle to kind of have that push to militaristically win their warfare. So it's in a sense, I mean, if you want to look at this as a historical comparison, um, and I was thinking about this earlier and I've already brought it up, um, but JFK is, I think, actually a really good example. Now, if you know your, you know, your American history in the 60s, you'll know that there was a post-World War II, I, I, I've talked about this just, previously in how the people did want something new and different but we also had a generation of people who were very like you know hardened to battle we had things like um very elusive espionage networks the cold war was kind of you know really becoming a thing and the soviets got the atom bomb and it was quite a pretty terrifying time and i think people just assumed we'd be having a third world war at that time with the soviets but Kennedy, who kind of came into power as this like fresh pay, uh, fresh faced Democrat who was like seen as a progressive, he had like constant battles with the like the old generals who were quite warmongery. Like if you've ever seen the um the film Doctor Strangelove, uh, you know, the Kubrick film, which talks about the you know, shows a lot of the kind of lunacy of like the militaristic ethos back in the like the forties and fifties and sixties. Um, that's to me um, kind of where we're at here. That's kind of the Brotherhood of uh, Cincinnati is very much that like old world generals who just think they can solve all their problems by bombing folk. Whereas Katrina Steiner and Kennedy are very much on that like actually there's a better way to do this, which is a practical way. You know they're not they've not got their finger on the chicken switch so to speak, but they actually know that the only way to resolve this is through diplomacy and. and Things that are, you know, more proactive as opposed to just going in and blowing things up. So the response to that by the Brotherhood of, of Cincinnati is to become terrorists, effectively. And that's really where they, like, um, that's, I think, how people view them in the Battletech world as general, you know, in general. What I talked about previously is them as a veterans group very much like spawns them into a pretty like cloak and dagger elusive society that are all through cell networks. The fact that they're in cell networks makes me really think that they are a terrorist organization because, you know, if you look back at like, say, Irish history, uh, the precursor to the um, the Irish Republican Army is the Irish Republic Republican Brotherhood. Um, or the IRB, they were all done in cell systems. Why do terrorist organisations use cell systems? Well, if one gets caught, they can't give up the names of the other leaders because they don't know. So, like, the person orchestrating it might be... or There might not even be anyone orchestrating it. They purposely keep everything so fragmented. And that's kind of... That's why, like, over the last, like, 20 years, specifically in, like, wars that... Um, like Western Alliance has been waging, when you if you talk about like Afghanistan, it is literally impossible to destroy, say like the Taliban in Afghanistan because they're in splinter cells, and if you destroy one, another one just pops up. 
So it's it's just a it's a really like it's I mean it's a brilliant system in terms of like orchestrating a you know an underhanded war, but it's horrifying for the people trying to combat it. And the you know the Lyrans will have very much uh, had that issue as well. Now, again, where it differs from like our real world politics, what I was saying about Kennedy earlier is that the generals in the U.S. never systematically went to war with their own people and created you know oh we can't have war with the, we can't have peace with the russians we're gonna bring the war to our own people until they understand that that never happened but you know the brotherhood of Cincinnatus did so they did kind of veer into you know committing pretty horrific acts against their own people um and that's it really that's where they are like that's where they become a, like an interesting organization at, at that time period and there's lots of like weird rumors about them and uh, like underhanded things going on they also like they're very duplicitous like at the top ends of it they'll talk about their love for katrina steiner because she is i mean katrina steiner is a patriot she's you know one of the greatest steiners on the throne she does wonderful things there but it's just that her kind of intentions are so at odds with like the old like militaristic way of doing things um but I do think out of all the kind of weird secret societies in Battletech, they are one of the most interesting. A lot because they are they are aligned so much to like the Lyran way of life and that like the the militaristic aspect to it mixed with the kind of that martial Germanic um, thing. And I think if I was playing like a campaign with them, um, they'd be really really fun to do with that. I think that it'd be especially fun if you were role playing. If you're doing like a role, which I don't do role play games, but I'd imagine if you created some kind of like, you know, the Brotherhood of uh, Cincinnati and infiltrating them, or you join them, or you're kind of sympathizers for them, or whatever else, they'd be super interesting within within Battletech to do that. I think they're, they're almost a little bit underdeveloped as well. I'd like to see some kind of uh, resurgence of them. In a sense, like, I think like Comstar occupies so much of like the weird, like quasi religious secret society stuff that goes on within like the Word of Blake and and Comstar. I think a lot of the other stuff is kind of uh, overlooked. It's why in this series of uh, videos I won't be doing Comstar or um, the you know the Word of Blake because it's so spoken about. It's so prevalent. It's to me. It's quite. Again, the word of Blake was what it was, and a lot of people don't like it, including myself. But I don't really find anything interesting in that, just because it's so like centrifugal to the Battletech experience. Whereas these little organisations, this like the Brotherhood of Cincinnati, is so odd and strange, but reflective of our own experience as well in the real world. You know, like it is like a Masonic order that's like a veterans group that carries out assassinations and terrorist activity and things like that. Um, so it could really do with developing, I think. It would be really interesting to see them uh, bring that back. It would especially, like... I don't, even though I'm very much committed to my, like, um, time period within Battletech, which is that 3025 to 3067 era, what I've read about, like, the, the Ilkhan era, which all takes place in around 3150... There are snippets of that where I could potentially get back into it. I really just want to give a complete pass to the, um, like the Word of Blake and the Dark Ages and the, um, is it the Republic of the Inner Sphere? The things I've read about them just sound terrible. But I think going forward, I may give that. Like, I might try and pick things up in thirty one fifty. You know, going forward, it'll give me a chance to read some of the new books and things like that. But that period's really interesting because how Steiner at that time is in a complete mess. Um, as are the Davians. Like the Davians have actually had um, Avalon um, like taken over, or New Avalon taken by the Draconis Combine of all forces. Um, but the the how Steiner are particularly in a mess. Like they they're really kind of betwixt and between, like um, the clan powers and. You know, they've got like Clan Wolf, Clan Jade Falcon causing like major drama for them. And so having something like the Brotherhood of Cincinnati back in that time period, I think could be quite interesting. Like, have they changed with the times? Do they now see like how Steiner is a failed organisation? Do they still have that like level of dedication to what is the, the notion of that really powerful, uh, like martial, militaristic Lyran state? So it could be something, hopefully, that they rekindle. 
I think that would be quite interesting as well. There's a lot to be spoken about there. And, and at that period, of, you know, in the Battletech story, this this is a group now that have got some real history behind them. You know, you're talking like, you know, hundreds of years. It's not like when, when Battletech kicks off, this is like a 100-year-old organisation, which is still old, but it's not that old. Whereas in 3150, they've been around for a long time and they've seen a lot of stuff. You know, they've seen the clans invade. They've seen the Fedcom Civil War. They've seen the destruction of what they knew as this really powerful uh, Lyran Commonwealth. So there we are. Um, that's about it. There's not, like I said, it's it's scarce. The, the, the level of detail you get on them is pretty elusive, but it's really interesting. Um, and I really did want to talk about them um, in this little series because I think they make for a really wonderful antagonist as well, especially if you're playing um, like role-playing games. So look into that if, if role-playing is your thing. It's certainly something that um, I had fun reading all the, the books about them. It, it's, it, it really does remind me of all the kind of secret society, Illuminati stuff that we, you know, like read about on the internet now and that, you know, so many people, God forbid, believe in. So um, it kind of reflects that quite well. And it's, I think that's that's more representative though. The people that wrote Battletech in the 80s and 90s were well aware of that like counterculture that was coming out of the US that all came, kind of came from the 60s. You know, that like, oh, you can't trust the government. So this is kind of the, their narrative representation. So just as, you know, in terms of like socio, um, like political thing, this is quite interesting that people who were writing back then were writing it for their own fiction. I find stuff like that quite interesting. Anyway, I'm going to leave that here. So hopefully you enjoyed that little rambling on um, the, the Lyran State and their weird and wonderful secret society. Um, I'm just going to do these like talks sporadically over the next few months. So you might see like part five and part six spring up over, you know, in, in the short term. But I'm not going to commit to anything like, you know, Catalyst might announce another big drop next week and I might go back to doing like the commercial side of it and speak about the Kickstarters and things like that. So we'll see what happens. Anyway, I will thank you very much for watching and I'll hopefully catch you again next time.